This is episode 130 of the Rio Grande Foundation's Tipping Point New Mexico podcast. I'm Paul Gessing. And I'm Wally Drangmeister. I'm president of the Rio Grande Foundation, New Mexico's free market think tank. You can find out more about the foundation at riograndefoundation.org. Wally, I've been uh, out and about doing some traveling here, and last week made my way to the Mayor's Energy Conference in Carlsbad, New Mexico. So uh, seeing what's going on firsthand out in the booming Permian Basin. And uh, I've never been to one of these conferences before. I don't know if they're an annual occurrence. I know they've had a few of them in recent years. But, uh, you know, Carlsbad's a lovely place. Uh, too hot for my taste. But, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, they had a event there 500 to 700 folks attending, a lot of oil and gas people directly involved in energy, a lot of pickup trucks in the parking lot. And uh, backed into the spaces, not nose in, you know, because they, they get used to parking that way on the uh, on drilling site. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely uh, a lot of good people out of, you know, fresh out of the patch, uh, listening and hearing what's going on. Uh, Something, I don't know uh, if it's ever happened before, but Michelle Lujan Grisham, the current governor and the former governor, Susana Martinez, were both in attendance. Although Michelle Lujan Grisham did speak, I don't think uh, Susana Martinez did, but she was there. And, uh, you know, just a really interesting group of people, a lot of folks engaged in this industry. Of course, times are very, very good in the energy patch in New Mexico. And, uh, you know, some of the presentations there really shed some additional light on uh, what's happening and expected to happen. And, you know, basically we're just getting started with this boom in the Permian Basin. And they laid out some scenarios with uh, uh, various production levels, but it's all going up, up, up. And, uh, you know, just very exciting stuff for the Permian Basin here in New Mexico. Wally, uh, I, you weren't down there, but I know you've got a background in the industry. And of course, you've uh, spent some time on this podcast talking with me about it. So uh, you know, have you ever been to one of those conferences down in uh, down in that Permian Basin? Yeah, I've been to a few of them. I spoke at one. It is a big deal. That's a huge, that's a huge uh, facility that they have for it. And, you know, uh, lots and lots of people. And uh, I imagine they're uh, pretty pretty pumped up about the industry in general and a little later in the podcast we'll talk about some things that might impact it even further so yeah one of the neat things that i learned a little bit about being down there was uh, the permian strategic partnership 19 of the largest energy producers in that region uh you know oil and gas companies essentially you know bp and uh, Exxon just being among them, uh, they are actually partnering on issues relating to the Permian Basin. And I was told that this is uh, unprecedented. And, uh, what they're doing is they are working on roads, so infrastructure specifically, but infrastructure can often mean things besides roads. There's, yes. there's no ART <laughs> going in in Permian Basin. These folks are way too <laughs> practical for those kinds of shenanigans. Spaceport 2, no, they're not talking that. You know, that would be that would be a lot of fun. And uh, some of these oil people are going to make enough money that they could easily afford that ticket. But again, uh, I think they're too practical. And, you know, that's a pretty speculative enterprise down there at the spaceport. Uh, improving schools, upgrading the housing situation, and working to train uh, the next generation of employees in that basin. And, you know, you had a, a few presentations where, Folks were basically cheerleading, literally. You know, some of the presentations were really interesting and really uh, something that I was glad to be there for. Some of them were CEOs and higher ups in these companies, basically saying, "My company is a great place to work. You should come work here." And, uh, if they're treating you mean at Brand X, come across the street. We exactly. got an opening for you. So that that's just an indicator of how bustling and booming things are. But of course, uh, you know. It is worth noting that we're not exactly known for our educational capacity here in the state of New Mexico. 
Uh, and, and in this case, you do need some college graduates, but I think they're really looking for at least high school graduates to get out in the field and do the work. And, you know, maybe there's a work ethic issue as well. But uh, anyway, these companies are all involved in trying to work collaboratively on these issues. And I think, you know, a lot of times you hear from the left, well, you know, if we didn't have government, who would build the roads or who would do all these other things? Well, uh, in this case, the Permian Strategic Partnership. Now, I would love to see a real experiment where you took that gas tax revenue and you gave it to a, a group of businesses and they got to uh, parse it out and dole it out for the roads. But uh, alas, we're stuck with our Davis Bacon wage rates and we're stuck with the folks in Santa Fe. But uh, really an interesting development and a uh, you know, good presentation that those folks put on. And, uh, you know, there are drawbacks, there are challenges when you get this kind of boom in any particular region. And, uh, you know, New Mexico in general is maybe less prepared for these kinds of things than a lot of other, uh, you know, cities and regions uh, when it comes to this boom in the Permian. Yeah, it, it is an interesting phenomenon down there. Uh, unemployment, uh, if you can pass a drug test, uh, almost unheard of. Salaries, very high. Signing bonuses for places like fast food restaurants. Uh, they don't need a minimum wage down there. The market has determined what it is. But uh, it is a very interesting thing. And uh, boy, the state of New Mexico is benefiting. And uh, hopefully they won't mess this up. I've uh, said the uh, cleaned up version of the oil man's prayer is... Uh, Lord, grant me just one more boom. I promise not to fritter this one away. <laughs> Although uh, the the true uh, the true epithet is a little uh, spicier than that, but yeah, this is this is an opportunity for New Mexico, and yeah, it may last for a while, but it could be gone quicker than you think, and maybe you know a decade or more uh, c- to come again. And so, yeah, this is a really inflection point for the state, really a time where they're going to have to make some tough decisions that will really impact uh, what happens for a long time to come. And on that note, uh, and we rarely kind of in real time track uh, price of a barrel of oil or any other economic indicators, we're much more attuned to the long term, uh, especially as it pertains to the state of New Mexico. But as we record this podcast, the price of a barrel of oil has literally skyrocketed. I saw earlier today that it's the largest one-day price increase in uh, history in terms of crude oil. We'd been bouncing around in the mid-50s, a little bit higher, maybe $56 or $57, uh, maybe a little lower down to 52 or 51. But as of right now, the price of a barrel of oil is up approximately 13%. It's now just... Uh, a little bit shy of $62 a barrel thanks to a drone strike carried out on a Saudi oil facility. I don't have all the details. It's a lot of foreign policy and a lot of questions about the region and the stability of the Middle East. But uh, boy, you know, things were blowing and going well enough in the Permian Basin at mid 50s. If you have a uh, sustained or even an increase due to the the potential of, say, a war or something in the Middle East. Not that anyone wants that to happen at all, but if you have some kind of real crisis coming out of the Middle East that drives the price of a barrel upward, it's, it's not going to be like the 70s where you had the lines because America is now the number one producer of oil, but it could give those producers another bounce. And quite frankly, it could give the state of New Mexico in the Permian Basin, even more uh, cash flowing through it. So, uh, you know, potentially beneficial news from some tragedy and bad news happening out in the Middle East. Yes, uh, the U.S. being such a huge producer, while that is a, you know, a dramatic increase for a short period of time, the price of oil is still, from historical point of view, not that high and then the thing to watch i do believe uh that is probably more important than the uh the spot price is that if you took take a look at what it does to the overall futures prices uh 6 12 18 months out because if that price goes up quite a bit then what oil companies are able to do is 
have hedges where they basically sell the production from the wells that haven't already been drilled yet, but they know that they can break even and be a little profitable at that price. Once that happens, that's where uh, this boom, which is continuing to uh, go on, although there's been a little bit of slowdown lately, may get back into full force. And so we'll have to see what happens in the Middle East, uh, certainly an area that the concern has always been what's going to happen if there's a war in the Middle East with the oil. Well, back in, uh, you know, 20 years ago might have been a whole different story. We, instead of seeing prices in the sixties, we may see again, not an unprecedented price up in the hundred, 120, 130, 140, 150. We're not seeing that yet. And, uh, you know, it's one of those following the Middle East. We'll have to follow that closely, but keep an eye on that long-term futures, what you can get, 18, 24 months out with regard to oil, that could be a huge driver to even more activity in New Mexico and West Texas. Yeah. And uh, uh, during the presentations, and I heard this more than once, and it's not something I'd ever even contemplated, but uh, multiple people at this conference they were presenting saying that the production in the Permian Basin is the safest production uh, available around the world. And uh, you don't think about it, but when you're getting a, a major oil facility bombed literally by uh, drone strikes due to uh, an ongoing civil war that Saudi Arabia is in, uh, it makes that Permian Basin fuel all the more valuable for us here in the United States. We may see prices go up, but we're not going to see shortages. We're not going to see an interruption in oil coming into the United States. And that is all yet another major uh, benefit to the United States and its economy uh, and that safety really against, you know, the kind of foreign attacks and kind of things that happen in so many parts of our world. It's another way in this region has really blessed us with its largesse. And I should note that, uh, yes, Michelle Lujan Grisham, the governor did speak at the uh, conference there. Uh, you know, and, and Michelle Lujan Grisham, her best vote, as I've told people before, in Congress was to uh, vote for a standalone bill that President Obama threatened to veto at the time to allow crude oil exports. Now, I'm not saying that Michelle Lujan Grisham is pro oil and gas, but she took a vote that was uh, pro industry when she was in Congress. All of her statements were pro energy, pro oil and gas in uh, at this Permian Basin Conference. She was definitely uh, aware of her audience, no matter what her true feelings and intentions are. She did not say anything that I felt, oh, she is coming after this industry. She does not you know, like what they're doing in this, that, and the other way. Uh, you know, there, There's a lot of folks who are concerned and I think have a right to be concerned about political uh, discussions happening in Santa Fe and the legislature, but she expressed great appreciation for the industry's role in helping her achieve some of her goals on education spending. And, you know, she said she liked to get out and see where the money was made in New Mexico as opposed to being in Santa Fe, et cetera. Uh, so I, I really, uh, you know, will criti critique uh, Governor Lujan Grisham for her activities and actions when she uh, does things that are negative to oil and gas or any other industry. But uh, definitely her statements to this group were uh, very positive and very even appreciative. So uh, we'll see how that goes if uh, she gets some more political pressure out of the environmental groups to take uh, more action against the industry itself. Well, New Mexico is certainly would be on the front line if uh, there is a national or a statewide policy of uh, – hindering the oil and gas industry. We would feel it here uh, first and most notably, I think, among all the states. Texas, while the industry is bigger there, has a much more diversified economy. And yes, New Mexico stands to lose a whole lot more than any other state with regard to any of those policies. And uh, uh, am I overstating to say there were no breathless... <gasps> For anything she said, so it was there is a it was a overall positive. There was no things that are going to make those oil guys uh, have nightmares uh, the next couple of weeks after hearing her talk. Well, what what shocked me was that three quarters of the room gave her a standing ovation upon introduction. That was very very uh, surprising to me in many respects. But 
shows that the industry is willing to uh, reach out and not take a hardline stance on uh, partisan issues one way or the other, at least initially with this governor. So uh, uh, I don't know how it's all going to shake out. She's got a long uh, time to be in office before uh, you know the end of her first four years. And if she gets reelected, she'll he have another four years on that. But uh, I, I think the industry at this point is willing to give her uh, a, a very reasonable hearing in terms of what she's up to. Yeah, and particularly since so much high quality real estate having huge amounts of oil that is economically obtainable in, as you said, a safe place. Uh, very few earthquakes, a uh, few bombing attacks from afar. You know, a lot of the things that you worry about oil production in other parts of the world, we just don't have those in Southeast New Mexico and West Texas. So great now, point uh, there. Wally, uh, you know, kind of the, the dark cloud of the silver lining or the, the dark lining to the silver cloud, I should say, in this area is uh, uh, that the state of New Mexico is increasingly taking on uh, the issue of ozone, ground level ozone to be exact. And this is one of those things that's a pollutant. It's something that, you know, you don't want to be in an area of truly high ozone. Uh, it's been covered recently. The The methane issue has really been, uh, as I've said before, one of the most covered issues in terms of the opinion pace, pages of uh, the newspapers of any issue I've ever seen. But ground level ozone, it's something that uh, you know, it, it's caused by chemical reactions near industrial sites. It's also caused in part by forest fires, vehicle emissions, and hot and sunny urban days are the the real time when these kinds of issues crop up with ground level ozone. So the New Mexico Environment Department is having public meetings across the state and I posted more information down at airsofenchantment.com. Uh, but before we kind of talk in too much detail about the issue of ozone and how serious it is, I you know, I always like to check to see, you know, when government is doing something, is it doing something in reaction to a real crisis or is it just doing something because it, it's got to prove its own existence and the, the reason for it to be around? And uh, the EPA, the US EPA in 2015, uh, made more strict regulations on ozone, uh, a reality, they endure, uh, put them into place. It's, of course, the Obama administration. And I thought it was worth checking out, you know, really how ozone uh, is evolving as an issue in the U.S. and even in the Southwest region. And uh, I could go online. Again, there's links available. But uh, ozone air quality, 1980 to 2018, uh, and the national trend based on 196 sites shows that we've seen a 31% decrease in the national average uh, in ozone uh, being in the air. And you can see a fairly dramatic downward trend in the chart <coughs> that I posted that I took directly from the EPA's website. Uh, so 31% down over the last uh, three or so decades is pretty darn actually close to four decades, I'm sorry. Uh, and then in the Southwest, so New Mexico is in that region, just since the year 2000, we've seen a 6% decrease. And that's with booming populations moving to states like Texas and New Mexico, booming oil production, uh, you know, economic growth that's uh, far outpacing the national average. And yet we've seen a 6% decline in ozone in the Southwest. So it may be an issue relative to the 2015 new regulations, but historically speaking, looking back over the last few decades, we are doing, uh, industry is doing a better and better job of reducing ozone, all the while population, economic growth, oil and gas production, all of those have gr grown very, very dramatically. So really good news here. But of course, government agencies are always happy to uh, you know, show that they're 
doing something, right, Wally? Yeah, and these ozone rules, uh, when they were were put in, I, I got to know more about them than I, I probably wanted to. A couple of points is air moves. You know, the fact that why is Bernalillo County in noncompliance? A lot of times it has to do with forest fires in uh, Oregon, Washington, Arizona. So what should our mitigation plan be? It may, the way the regulations are put forth, to do new industrial activity of any kind may require a far more stringent set of regulations when the actual problem is potentially hundreds of miles away. That's one factor. And then you see that in Nonyana County as well. A lot of their ozone problem has been traced to the Juarez area, but it makes industrialization in the United States where actually our even without ozone rules, our air quality standards for anything is so much more stringent than in Juarez, you might actually be making the problem worse. So it's one of those, the, uh, the solution and where the problem are sometimes are coming in different places. And your point about ozone layer, uh, ozone levels going down. Yeah, I've, I, I saw that trend uh, when I was studying it intently. But this could be a big deal for economic development and diversification in New Mexico, because if you're under these more stringent ozone rules and non-compliance with the EPA, it just makes things that are already hard, getting air quality permits for uh, emissions of any kind, just that much more difficult. Meanwhile, the people in Washington right next to the ocean, their smoke's blowing our way. Uh, maybe uh, our plan should be to uh, go up there and tell them to get their act together not punish businesses here locally uh, because of non-attainment. Yeah, and uh, ozone is the primary listed ingredient in smog, uh, according to at least reputable sites I looked at on the internet. And of course- Trademark, yes. smog. Yes. Smog. Yeah, yes. the proprietary formula that California had perfected. Right, and, <laughs> uh, and that's the point is that if you go to Los Angeles, which I generally don't recommend, but if you do have to go there for some reason- uh, you will notice that the modern air, especially in a city like LA, is much, much cleaner and less smog than there is. And that's a combination of you know gov useful government regulations. We're not against government regulation as a whole, just uh, you do experience diminishing returns because uh, these agencies don't go away uh, when they solve one of their problems, say smog. Uh, their inclination is, well, we solve that problem Let's go back and see if we can make it even better. And that may or may not be a good thing, but you eventually have a, a circumstance where regulations go up the price because it's harder to squeeze out those smaller and smaller gains. And then you, you just wind up raising the costs because of the same reason. It's more and more costly to reduce the, that problem, whatever it might be, ozone in particular in this case. So it's a, uh, a challenge inherent in government regulation, and it's unfortunate that we don't have maybe a sunset period on some of these federal agencies or federal policies. It would at least give us an opportunity to have a real discussion. But uh, ozone, uh, you know, we're not likely to see uh, additional regulation immediately, but there's no doubt that as part of this compliance effort that we are likely to see some kind of proposal at some point come out uh, where regula regulations are imposed. And of course, the oil and gas industry is right in the crosshairs of that whole discussion. Yeah, absolutely it is. Uh, the thing that I saw during the Obama administration, uh, similar to the point you're making about these regulations tend to not go away is they would actually put regulations in place that they knew there was virtually no chance of industry complying with and they put them in and they, and then industry would work fervently to try to do as good as they could. And then at the 11th hour, they would back those away. So it's almost like the uh, threatening focus. Uh, I think 
There may be an element of that with these ozone regulations, but the fact is that it's taking the current regulations and determining whether we're in non-attainment or attainment, meaning whether we're meeting the standards the EPA puts in. And so it doesn't necessarily require new regulation, just we go from the easier to comply to the tougher comply part of regulation, and it could do real damage to our economy. Yeah, a few government regulations in recent memory. Uh, Of course, ethanol and gasoline is just a ridiculous waste of perfectly good corn and uh, uh, the energy that goes into growing that corn. And And the uh, water that goes into it. uh, It's something that studies have shown that is more harmful to the environment. But of course, Voters in Iowa get to cast those precious early ballots for president, and uh, you know they've been able to uh, stave off any uh, any elimination or reduction. And the same is uh, the case for the renewable fuels mandate, which that switchgrass stuff that President George W. Bush talked about making elect- uh, energy out of gasoline. It's one that they can't even figure out how to do correctly and produce enough of it to fulfill the the mandates of the government. So, uh, and yet we keep moving forward with these policies in place. And uh, Wally, uh, kind of a similar policy that's actually up for discussion right now that we took note of is cafe uh, standards. This is your fuel economy, corporate average fuel economy is the acronym for CAFE, not the CUFF uh, that the <laughs> president mistweeted several months ago. Uh, this one is CAFE, and it's been around since at least the Ford administration. Uh, it, but this is one that the president is right on about. Uh, it, there's a lot of regulations still out there, and the president can still go in and take out some of these onerous and harmful regulations. But uh President Obama had put in place a mandate on CAFE that was taking it to 51 miles per gallon, uh, been scheduled for 2025. It's already gone up to 37 miles per gallon, uh, but the administration is planning on freezing that regulation right there. And uh, there's a lot of controversy, a lot of give and take about California and its fuel economy standards and whether they can be uh, independent acting separately from the federal government as a whole. There's already been legal uh, filings made to determine that fact. Uh, There was a long period in the what 70s, I'm sure of where California was the standard for the US kind of. It's like they had a more stringent standard because there's such a large market for um, automobiles Right. And that's kind of uh, what this is actually that's, about. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. The, but this that's taking this on directly to say, is that legal? Back then, it was either legal or wasn't challenged because California really did have a, uh, a big say in uh, putting poorly performing catalytic converters that destroyed gas mileage back in those days. Well, that's but, the clean air issue. <laughs> no, that, I mean, they, they relate, though. Right. They do relate. Right. But this is directly uh, fuel economy. Right. And uh, fuel economy is different. You know, obviously, a catalytic converter treats the air coming out of the exhaust pipe, doesn't really affect your fuel economy. But uh, the point is, is that CAFE standards came out of those oil uh, shortages in in the 70s. And the idea was to make make the cars more efficient so that we didn't have to import so much oil. And so we had... Uh, that situation reduced in its intensity and prices would be brought out in control. But government mandates don't go away. And now the problem, of course, is climate change and global warming. So this is the being you know, discussed under a totally different problem structure because we know we have enough oil in this country for many, many decades to come. It's a matter of, uh, you know, is climate change a serious issue? Is this the way to enforce and address it? Uh, And that is open to question. But according to the Heritage Foundation, uh, CAFE standards would raise prices by $3,800 for an average vehicle. There's also the issue of trucks, uh, which are, you know, trucks and SUVs, which are becoming more and more popular as we see around New Mexico. 
And I would say we're a state that more people than average like to drive pickup trucks and heavier vehicles because there is a lot more work. You know, like I said, you go down to the oil patch in Carlsbad. And, uh, I had a rental Volkswagen Beetle, the new generation. And, you know, I was about to the bottom of the door panels on uh, some of those trucks. And, you know, 95% of the vehicles there were, were trucks. And uh, those are covered under completely different rules. The cafe standards don't even apply in the same way to trucks and SUVs. Uh, so it's just poor regulation at the outset. I don't think Trump even is going to be able to completely uh, get the government's boot off the necks of the uh, motorists and people consuming uh, gasoline in this way, but it's at least taking that uh, fuel economy standard that was 51 miles an hour. How many people out there are driving 51 mile per gallon vehicles? Not a whole lot. Uh, and I think that the Obama administration was making political points, not making policy reality. Yeah. And then, you know, what's 51 miles per gallon mean? It means smaller, lighter, largely hybrid vehicles. And uh, there's been a lot done on the safety issues, particularly since you still have large trucks on the road, uh, both the uh, tractor trailers, the quote unquote semis that haul freight. And then you're in a continually getting smaller and lighter vehicle. Uh, Safety is also a, a, a factor. So, yeah, there's a lot there's a lot here that I don't think is necessarily optimized by this level of regulation. I'd like a 51 mile per gallon pickup until I figure out what that thing would look like. And I don't think it's going to uh, be a very efficient tool for most things that I'd want to do. The lawnmower engine it would require would be uh, highly difficult to get up to highway speeds. <laughs> yes, think, exactly. La Bajada Hill at 12 miles per hour. Yes. Uh, Wally, we had a nice event this week and uh, thanks for coming out for it. Uh, Christina Sandifer of the Goldwater Institute she does both legal uh, work at Goldwater, and Goldwater is the uh, uh, the New Mexico, the Rio Grande Foundation of Arizona, or you could say more appropriately, the Rio Grande Foundation is the Goldwater Institute of Arizona because they're about <laughs> ten times our size, uh, budget wise and staff wise. Uh, uh, Goldwater Institute is considered one of the gold standards of think tank, uh, you know, activism and work. Uh, they have a legal arm. Their legal arm is representing us on our continuing soda tax campaign finance violation issue. It's just been slow going with that. But Christina is a dynamo. She is uh, a great speaker and a uh, wonderful, wonderful person, really, in general. And uh, she talked about property rights. And I think the nice thing, and what I really want to mention is that I didn't help her at all with her presentation. She knows property rights uh, like the back of her hand, but she specifically mentioned two of the Rio Grande Foundation's great victories, <clears throat> which were eminent domain reform. That's you know the Suzette Kilo situation where the government took her house in Connecticut to give it to a major international drug company, Pfizer, ultimately not even constructing the project that they had planned. Uh, so that was one of them. Uh, and that's a law that we got passed with uh, Bill Richardson and his administration uh, so more than a decade ago. And then civil asset forfeiture reform, which passed the legislature in 2015, which basically uh, in New Mexico is a national leader on that issue, says that you as an individual cannot have your goods taken by your car, your house, by the government without being convicted of some kind of crime that just taking it because they think you might be doing something with that that's not 100% legal, that is not ethical or right, and then it set up, sets up some bad um, uh, incentives for police and government officials. So uh, Sandifer's presentation was great. It'll be up on errorsofenchantment.com and riograndefoundation.org. But Wally, any other thoughts on the Christina Sandifer event? Well, she's fantastic uh, speaker, fantastic presenter. And w what I did appreciate was, uh, you know, examples are important when it comes to 
being able to explain economics and policy decisions. And she had, she did a fantastic job using the, uh, you know, the Airbnb type of examples, some of the modern examples that local governments in particular have been fighting and some of the uh, bad consequences and bad incentives that comes from that. And so, yeah, I encourage anyone to listen to it. Uh, she's a, uh, a co-author of the book on the topic and just uh, very good stuff. Uh, the furthest thing from dry economic policy, uh, you know, when you hear, you see the title, you might think, oh my goodness, this is not uh, what I want to watch, something I want to listen to. I highly recommend it. I think you'll learn a lot. And she's, she's just a great presenter at it. You got it. I agree completely. And, uh, you know, her and her husband, Tim, both, uh, Tim Sandifer is also uh, a lawyer and freedom fighter at the Goldwater Institute. So they have a, a pro-liberty power couple out there. Uh, Tim was a speaker for Milton Friedman Day, which we did for several years on uh, the great economist's birthday, which was July 31st. I think he would be 102 or three at this point. Uh, they They stopped supporting that particular event a few years ago. But Tim was one of our speakers uh, at a recent event. He's a great guy as well. So, uh, Wally, I'm heading to Rio Doso and Roswell again this week for a couple of rotary engagements and other presentations. So, folks, uh, if you're listening to this and you happen to be in the Rio Doso area and you can make the Rotary Club at Cree Meadows at noon on Tuesday, uh, don't hesitate to give us a call, 505-264-6090. We'd love to have you out. We're also uh, uh, doing an evening event at Zoka Coffee on Tuesday evening. I want to say that's at 5 p.m., but again, give us a call, 505-264-6090. I'll be at the Rotary in R Roswell on Wednesday. That's at the Snazzy Pig uh, at noon, which I just love saying the name of that particular. Well, and I actually I love eating there too. So. <laughs> yeah, no, they have in addition a, to being a cool good name. barbecue. Yes. yes. Yeah, so, a couple of those things this week. But Wally, uh, I think the big news, and certainly if you are in the Albuquerque Metroplex today, the arrival of one Donald J. Trump, forty-fifth president of the United States, is the uh, reality we're all dealing with, uh, you know, a lot of folks are really excited to go see the president. Other folks are less excited to deal with the traffic tie-ups <laughs> that are inevitable as a result of his uh, arrival here. But regardless, President Trump is here. And what I think is more important for the conservative free market movement in New Mexico is that he thinks he can win New Mexico. And with the devastation that we've seen of the New Mexico Republican Party, certainly in 2018, having the top of the ticket, uh, somebody who thinks they can win this state and they're going to put time and resources and energy into winning New Mexico, that's at least something. That's definitely going to help this state uh, down ballot races as we move into 2020. Yeah, and uh, Trump, I think, has a pretty compelling case for uh, why someone in New Mexico would vote for him. Again, this is not a political comment. This is looking at it. Uh, what he's done, the, his approach to regulation and tax decreases have done things like uh, keep electricity rates from going up. Uh, p and able to take advantage of that. It certainly helped the oil and gas industry with regard to Bureau of Land Management leases and oil and gas and the development of that industry. And so there are a lot of good things that he has done that have really dramatically benefited New Mexico. And then it's just a question of, uh, can he make some hay there? Can he move some voters from one side to the other? Or uh, what often does happen in New Mexico, does no good deed go unpunished and it won't make a, an impact. This will be interesting. But yeah, it sounds like he's here to play for, uh, play for votes in the upcoming uh, general election. And of course, you are right in terms of Trump and his policies having uh, had good tidings for New Mexico's economy. I point you no further than Bloomberg.com. Not a, not a news organization uh, started, of course, by Michael Bloomberg, the former New York mayor and now funder of a wide variety of leftist causes. Uh, but the article from September the 30th, 2018, so just a little under a year ago, 
New Mexico, top performing state economy since Trump took office. I, I would encourage you to find that article for yourself. But basically, uh, the whole article details how uh, much New Mexico turned around since uh, Donald Trump took office. And, you know, it's worth going through, I think, uh, a few of the electoral numbers from 2016. Now, as you'll recall, 2018 was a bad year for Republicans, but 2016 was a pretty decent year for Republicans, not the least of which is because uh, they got the president elected. But 48% uh, went for Hillary, 40% for Trump, 9.3% for Gary Johnson, and then you had Jill Stein, 1.2, McMullen, a little under a percent, and various some sundry other parties uh, also under 1%. And I think Trump's looking at, well, maybe there's some movement. Maybe I have somebody unpopular against me. Uh, and he's not exactly racking up the popularity numbers himself. But uh, I think if he figures that he can get three quarters to four fifths of the Gary Johnson vote and, uh, you know, nibble into some of uh, Hillary Clinton or, you know, get some of those Clinton voters that went that way to either stay home or uh, or not vote for the next Democrat elected, that he will be able to win the presidency. So I, I agree with you on the numbers. There's at least a shot that Trump could win New Mexico in 2020. Of course, we've still got more than a year to go. And, uh, you know, I think it's good for the state of New Mexico, and it shows the power of the Electoral College that he is even here. Because if you get rid of the Electoral College, he you goes to California, no, New York, and Texas and Florida, and that's about it. No Maybe president, Illinois. no president of either party will ever show up in New Mexico, or at least they will be very, except very to scarce. go skiing or vacationing, exactly. perhaps. <laughs> so yes. it's a, it, it makes New Mexico relevant. Yes, it'll be a pain in the butt. Uh, sitting in traffic for you know part of one afternoon if you're not already out there because I know people were out at the Santa Ana Star Center very very early this morning to uh, get in line to get into that uh, that rally and you know hopefully it goes well hopefully there's no violence or any uh, you know any disrespect of people's right to assemble and to uh, hear their you know petition their government or hear their uh, their, their speeches and talk about what they want to talk about but. You know, it, it, it's an important thing, and it is worth noting that the, the Electoral College keeps New Mexico in the discussion. Yes, w without a doubt. I uh, uh, know a lot of media people, and uh, believe me, they're the most happy that the Electoral College exists because without it, uh, election year uh, ads for them would be down, you know, 20, 30, 40 percent from what they are. And, and interest. And, and interest. interest. And the fact is, is that translates. Uh, long term to policies. And that interestingly, from my reading, you know, not a uh, historical expert, although I've started to read quite a few books about it, that was the idea of the Electoral College is to not concentrate all of the power of selecting the presidency in the most populous states because uh, the founding fathers were worried things would happen that wouldn't be beneficial necessarily for the country. And uh, it has played out in a very interesting fashion over, over the years. And, uh, to the benefit of oh fair New Mexico, and while I may not be thrilled that Iowa's corn farmers get their ethanol subsidies in, uh, <laughs> thanks in part to the Electoral College, there are drawbacks primarily of, from the draw, Electoral drawbacks <laughs> as well as pluses. Yeah, there I, are. I still think that overall it is a much better system, much more beneficial to the state of New Mexico than the alternative. So with that. Thanks for listening to this week's podcast. Make sure to get the latest edition of Tipping Point New Mexico by subscribing at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify. You can post or comment on this and other episodes on Facebook and Twitter and tell Google Home to play Tipping Point New Mexico. Thanks to Path 3 Marketing for producing this show. 